Drains singing and on piano, accompanied by an unidentified mandolinist and backup singers. This is historian explaining. A historian tells you why everything you know is wrong. You can find these lectures on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, and YouTube. And if you want to keep hearing them, I urge you to take a look at my Patreon page, also under historian explaining. On July 9th, 1776, when New Yorkers heard the Declaration of Independence read publicly for the first time, a crowd gathered on the Bowling Green, the small park at the southern end of Manhattan, where there was a grand gilded equestrian statue of George III. And they wound ropes around the statue and pulled and pulled until all the ropes broke found more ropes, began again, and finally pulled the statue down, which was then stripped of its gold covering, and the lead inside was melted down for bullets. Around the same time, in Barnstable County in Massachusetts, the courthouse put up an effigy of King George III, which they hanged. They then took the effigy down, burned it, and buried the ashes in the ground. Americans did things like this in a sort of wave of iconoclasm in July 1776 as a way of acting out the psychological break, their disavowal of their hundreds of years of loyalty to the British crown and to this symbol of the nation that they had been devoted to for their entire lives. And they violently attacked those symbols uh, as a way of trying to extirpate the old loyalties and the old attachments that they probably still felt. In a very similar way right now, we see uh, towns and cities around America deciding to take down their statues of Confederate heroes and sometimes mobs uh, gathering spontaneously, tearing those statues down uh, and symbolically attacking them, kicking and spitting. Some of you have probably seen some of the images uh, kind of acting out their disgust and their fury in a very similar way, in a way that probably hasn't really been seen uh, at least since World War I and the great destruction of German symbols in America, and arguably since, since 1776. Statues are meant to be psychological symbols as well as uh, political symbols. You know, there's really no separation between the two. Statues tend to represent sort of the psychological loyalties underpinning politics. So, what are we to make of this uh, wave of iconoclasm that's happening in America right now? Uh, well, that's a very complicated question, but we have to stop for a few minutes and see if we can actually understand the history uh, underlying these statues and other symbols, why they're there, where they came from, and as part of that, understanding what the Confederacy was. Where did it come from? What was it all about? And this is a difficult historical subject because it is such a political flashpoint. And there have been many attempts over the years to change and revise what the Civil War was, why it happened, and why the two sides fought. It's still very much a matter of, of confusion. But if we look back at the historical record, at the evidence that we have, we can get some answers. So I'm going to talk a bit about how did the Confederacy come into being? What were the political forces at work? What did it stand for in the eyes of Confederate citizens and soldiers themselves? And how has it been represented since then? And this story really should begin at least back in um, 1776 uh, when the 
Declaration of Independence was read, and when Americans were producing all kinds of speeches and letters and pamphlets proclaiming belief in natural rights, the rights of man, as Thomas Paine said, uh, the, the equality of all men before the law, uh, and, uh, and in the eyes of God, as some, as some believed, uh, many people, both in America and in Britain, many people pointed out the hypocrisy and the inconsistency of these American rebels proclaiming their belief in civil and social equality while holding hundreds of thousands of slaves. So people did see this inconsistency at the time, and that is a large reason for the first launching of the abolitionist movement, okay, which began with anti-slavery societies organizing in New England and Philadelphia in the 1770s, and then in Britain in the 1780s. After the Revolutionary War in the 1780s and 90s, there was a fairly wide consensus especially among Americans, a, a, a fairly broad consensus that slavery was immoral, that it was unjust, and that, most importantly, it was contrary to the ideals and principles of the revolution. And it was very common, including for slaveholders themselves, to acknowledge this, this dilemma and to admit that slavery eventually ought to end. Right? And there, people had all kinds of notions and schemes for how slavery could be phased out. Uh, you know, th you could draw a certain date and say any person born after this date is free. That is what happened in Pennsylvania and in Rhode Island in the 1780s. Uh, or you could argue, as Thomas Jefferson did, that as the country expanded westward beyond the Appalachians, that somehow slavery would become too expensive or too cumbersome and with time the slaves would be freed by their masters until there were no more slaves. Okay, this was very wishful thinking, but this was a, a, a commonly espoused idea. And Jefferson himself, you know, his, his, his life with his slaves has been much discussed and, and it's a very multi-layered uh, story. But Jefferson was not entirely out of the norm. And he very openly said uh, that, you know, slavery was shameful and that it should eventually be ended. In his notes on the state of Virginia in 1774, he talked about the numbers of slaves that were held on plantations in Virginia. And he said very suddenly in the middle of this book on Virginia, he said, I tremble for my country when I consider that God is just and that his justice cannot sleep forever. So he's imagining that there's going to be some kind of divine punishment upon Virginia. And when he says my country, he, he means Virginia. Uh, there'll be some sort of divine punishment for this, this shame of, of slaveholding. However, he, he himself did not free his slaves. Uh, he knew and, and said very openly, Virginia is economically dependent on slavery, and I am simply not willing to give it up. And he said in a later letter, uh, holding slaves is like having a wolf by the ears. You know that you eventually have to let it go, but you're afraid to do it. Right? So Jefferson acknowledged his own weakness, really, and the power uh, of, of, of fear that prevented him from freeing his slaves. In addition to that, there were also laws that inhibited him from freeing his slaves uh, that came in later in his life, but I'll, I'll talk about those later. Washington uh, did free his slaves upon his death. He actually intended to do so a bit earlier while he was president in the 1790s. He began to make plans to emancipate his slaves and to give them portions of the land of his plantation at Mount Vernon. However, at that time, he was in a certain political uh, quandary where he was trying to persuade Southern senators to ratify Jay's Treaty, a very controversial treaty with Britain. And his political allies said, don't free your slaves because cer certain Southern senators will take that as an insult. 
implying that slavery was wrong. Uh, and so he scrapped this plan and instead stipulated in his will that his slaves should be freed on, on his death, which uh, most of them then were. So Jefferson too, excuse me, Washington, like Jefferson, acknowledged the immorality and injustice of slavery. He acknowledged that it was contrary to American revolutionary ideals, but he was not willing to pay the full price, political, social, economic, of, of actually freeing his slaves. So if you had looked around America in the late 1790s or even as late as 1800, it could seem, credibly, as if slavery was on its way out. And there were a number of reasons why this was true. Uh, there, uh, there was a widespread consensus that it was wrong. It was becoming very common for slaveholders to free their slaves. There was a, a growing free black population. Certain laws were loosened to make it easier to free slaves. Uh, and there was a beginning of a movement to repatriate slaves back to Africa. And some uh, free African people themselves actually took part in this movement, which made a bit more sense at that time because a large portion of the slaves in America were actually African born. Uh, and there was uh, the, the revolution in Haiti where slaves actually violently rose up and overthrew slavery, which sent you know, shockwaves of fear through much of uh, North America but encouraged a lot of people to take further steps to free their slaves and to try to bring about the eventual end of slavery in order to prevent that kind of revolution from happening in North America. So if you looked around in 1800, it, it, it could reasonably seem like slavery was on its way out. But the trajectory quickly shifted after 1800. In the North, anti-slavery opinion continued to grow and strengthen, and s states, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Rhode Island and Pennsylvania abolished slavery in the 1780s, Massachusetts also, and over time, all the Northern states abolished slavery, ending with New York was the last Northern state to abolish completely in 1827. So you had this... Uh, continuation, really, north of the Mason-Dixon line, where public opinion against slavery continued to grow and to strengthen, and the institution was phased out. Whereas in the South, slavery suddenly became much more profitable, mainly because of the cotton gin, right? So slavery was very uh, widespread and entrenched in particular areas of the southern states, like Tidewater, Virginia, the South Carolina Low Country, South Louisiana. These were places where slave labor was very valuable because it could, slave labor could be used to grow certain very lucrative cash crops, right? Tobacco in Virginia and Maryland, uh, rice in coastal South Carolina, also indigo, and rice and indigo in Louisiana. Uh, so this is where and, and also sugarcane in Louisiana. So this, these are the particular places where slaves were highly sought after, there were large numbers of slaves, and people were making a lot of money off of slave labor. Cotton was a bit of a marginal case because you could grow cotton in many areas in the South, but it, was, it took so much labor to cultivate and harvest the cotton and then to process it to remove the seeds. So that was a major bottleneck in cotton production. And if you didn't go through that extra work and time of removing the seeds, then what you had was this very heavy, uh, tangled cotton fiber full of seeds, which wasn't really even valuable enough to be worth shipping to industrial areas like Britain or the North, where it could be processed into cloth. So cotton was comparatively less lucrative. This changed in 1790. So there were many uh, engineers and machinists in the 1780s looking for a solution, looking for a way to quickly remove the seeds from cotton. And the person who finally made uh, the breakthrough was Eli Whitney. 1790 invents the cotton gin, 
a sort of small threshing machine with kind of blades and needles that you can pass the cotton through and it will remove the seeds from the fiber. So this made it very quick and easy then to produce this very valuable and light cotton fiber that you could then inexpensively ship northward or abroad to Europe and get huge profits for. So suddenly slavery now becomes highly profitable, not just in those few concentrated areas like South Carolina Low Country, South Louisiana. Instead, it becomes highly valuable and profitable all over a huge swath of the South, anywhere that you can grow cotton. So slaves are now suddenly in enormous demand in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, and you get an explosion of westward movement uh, and a huge new class of people arises that is making tremendous profits and wealth off of cotton cultivation. And additionally, in those older cash crop areas that have their these colonial roots in Virginia, South Carolina, Louisiana, they benefit enormously too because the price of slaves goes way up. So they start making money basically by breeding and farming slaves and selling them into the internal slave trade where they then are put to work in the new cotton plantations. So the number of slaves in the United States increased from about 700,000, a little less than 700,000 in 1790, to over one and a half million in 1820. So the number of slaves more than doubles within about a generation. And as I said, slaves are highly valuable on the market. It is very profitable to breed slaves, to trade slaves, and to use them to produce uh, cash crops. By the mid-1800s, a slave uh, who was able to do work, uh, you know, an able-bodied adult slave, was, was worth about the same amount as a house. You know, so, so this was something, they were valuable enough that your whole life savings of a middle class person could go into owning a slave. And consequently to this, uh, as slaves became more and more valuable, it became less common for people to emancipate their slaves. And many states actually tightened their laws to discourage slave emancipation, right? So there was a, there was a reversal where now the laws become very restrictive as people see the slave population grow and they don't want to lose that valuable commodity that's such an important part of the economy and they don't want a population of free blacks. They don't want free African Americans who might encourage slaves to, to flee or encourage slave rebellion and so on. So, uh, so the laws become more restrictive, and this is part of why Jefferson didn't free his slaves, other than a few of them, was because he was heavily in debt, and after 1806, it became illegal to free your slaves if you were in debt, because those slaves were collateral, that were worth a, a lot of money, and it was considered sort of cheating your creditors to free your slaves in that, in that situation. So by about uh, 1820 or so, uh, well, definitely by 1820, uh, the states where slavery is still legal, which are all south of the Mason-Dixon line, other than New York, which is a holdout, uh, these states develop more and more of a sectional consciousness. And they see that their views and practices regarding slavery are diverging more and more dramatically from uh, the North, right? Whereas the North has continued in this trajectory of sort of discouraging and phasing out slavery. In the South, it's become more entrenched and more important socially and economically. Southerners begin to refer to slavery as their peculiar institution. And this is an important phrase. You've maybe heard it before, but uh, the meaning is important. So peculiar didn't just mean uh, odd or out of the ordinary, the way we use it today. Peculiar, more at root, means distinguishing, a thing that is unique to something, right? So you could say, uh, you know, the, the, 
blonde hair and blue eyes are peculiar to Northern Europeans, right? They're not something that shows up in other populations around the world. Uh, well, likewise, Southerners began to speak of slavery as our peculiar institution in the sense that it is what defines us and distinguishes us from the rest of the country. They began to put forward more and more of a positive good argument, the notion that slavery was not just sort of a necessary evil and it was not something to be ashamed of. It was actually good. It was good for civilization and prosperity and the African people were somehow better off or better or, or suited to being slaves. They also made biblical arguments that, um, that slavery is sanctioned by the Bible. And this was very important at a time of, of religious awakening in the early 1800s. And in particular, a Senator John C. Calhoun of South Carolina really helped to shape this sectional consciousness of the South and argued that the South needed to use particular constitutional strategies to protect their interests within the larger country. And Calhoun was a senator and he saw the Senate as the crucial institution through which the South could protect its, its sectional interests through strategies like the filibuster. So that even if the majority opinion in most of the country tended to be anti-slavery, the South would still maintain uh, its and protect its interests. And an early sort of eruption of this sectional conflict between slave states and non-slave states was in 1820 over the question of whether the Missouri Territory should be admitted to the Union, and if so, should it be uh, a, a slave state or a free state. And uh, you know, Jefferson saw this intense controversy about Missouri in 1819 and 1820, and he said, this is a fire bell in the night. It's a warning that uh, the controversy between the regions about slavery is only going to keep intensifying, and he, he believed that it would eventually lead to war. Uh, so Jefferson foresaw this, and so did others from the North, like, uh, like John Quincy Adams, believed that eventually the controversy over slavery was going to lead to a war. So at the same time that this uh, sectional consciousness and pro-slavery philosophy was growing in, uh, in the South, a radical abolitionism emerged in the North, right? And really came to the fore in about 1830, 1831. So certain Northerners who uh, held anti-slavery views, which were common, uh, began to get more radicalized when they saw how Southern states could successfully use constitutional strategies to protect slavery and were extending it further into the West, into Western territories. So uh, a sort of more radical abolitionism uh, emerges in, in the North, especially in New England. And some of them actually advocate for secession. There were some Northern abolitionists who believed that uh, they said no, no union with slaveholders. They believed that by being part of the union together with slaveholders, they were helping to protect and perpetuate slaveholding. This uh, abolitionism and this increasing anti-slavery uh, mindset in the North fit into a larger free labor ideology, right? So the North was beginning to industrialize and it was becoming a more urban industrial society as time went on. And there was a great deal of inequality. There was a great deal of poverty in the North and uh, criticizing slavery served in part to help cover over and sort of distract from the, uh, this inequality and, and poverty and unrest that you could see uh, in the North. It was a way to sort of point to something in another part of the country. And if you attacked slavery, it reinforced this idea that society is just as long as workers are free and they're, they're working for wages and they can freely engage in employment or not. It sort of, uh, it, it justified that worldview if you cast slavery as the sort of one unacceptable uh, outlier. Many of them saw slavery as a national embarrassment. You know, they, uh, Great Britain abolished slavery throughout its empire in 1834. 
and uh, Britain was the main you know, trading partner of the United States, and increasingly the United States looked more and more like a, a sort of backwards uh, country that was in, in danger of becoming a pariah country, as it not only kept slavery, but as slavery grew and extended throughout the continent. There also was a wing that emerged, especially in the 1840s, of uh, Democrats and political moderates in the North who were not necessarily abolitionist. They didn't necessarily think that slavery had to be immediately abolished throughout the country, but they did want to contain slavery within the places where it currently existed and they didn't want to see it extended into the Western territories, right? So this free, free soil thinking emerges during the controversy over Missouri and it becomes bigger and more powerful and attracts more followers. And a lot of the people who, who advocated for free soil, they weren't necessarily abolitionist, they didn't necessarily believe in equality, but rather they thought that the upper the opportunities presented by those Western territories would be lost to white Americans if slavery was allowed in the Western territories. So um, it would uh, drive down wages and it would gobble up land that could otherwise be used by white settlers. So there, so there were some of these free soilers in the North, especially from about 1840 onward, who uh, opposed slavery or at least opposed the extension of slavery into the West for different reasons from the, uh, from the abolitionists. This uh, controversy over slavery in the West really becomes the big burning uh, argument and fight between the North and the South from the 1840s uh, onward. And there's a, a huge uh, uproar in Congress in 1846 over the Wilmot Proviso. You may have heard that, that phrase uh, maybe in high school history. The proposal that a Northern uh, Congressman put forward saying that uh, if and when we go to war with Mexico, which was looking increasingly likely, and seize that territory in, in New Mexico and Arizona and so forth from Mexico, those territories should all be free territories, no slavery allowed. And this uh, caused a huge uproar and uh, division between Northern and Southern congressmen that then had to be sort of suppressed and sidelined during the Mexican War. But it didn't uh, go away. And finally, in uh, 1854, the, uh, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed, which allowed for the possibility of slavery being extended into the Kansas and Nebraska territories, also Western uh, federally administered territories. And this reopened this controversy uh, with a new intensity. The Whig party didn't have a clear position. They had largely acquiesced in the Kansas-Nebraska Act. So they didn't have a clear consensus one way or the other on how they felt about the extension of slavery into the West. So the Whig party collapsed, uh, disbanded, and in its place, the Republican Party was founded in 1854. And the Republican Party is a big tent coalition of anti-slavery people, you know, abolitionists, free soilers, and basically the whole range of people who disapproved of the idea of slavery being extended into the Western territories. So the Republican Party is the first uh, viable national anti-slavery party although they're not, again, they're not all abolitionists. Now, just a brief comment on why was this question of the extension of slavery into the Western territories so crucial? Why was it such a big deal? Well, you know, from the Northern point of view, they didn't want to see slavery continuing to expand. They didn't want to see uh, the Western lands gobbled up by big uh, slaveholding planters. For the South, it was, it was, both an economic question and a question of principle. So uh, it was an economic question because slaves were enormously valuable and people were making a lot of money off of trafficking slaves. 
mainly because there was always more Western territory to move into and bring under uh, cultivation. And if that was closed off, if you said, okay, west of the Mississippi or west of uh, Missouri, no more slavery, then the value of these slaves would diminish, right? If you didn't have always this more territory to keep colonizing, right? And we need to, to, to be aware that, you know, we may have this image today of sort of the old South, people really attached to their plantations and their land. That's actually not historically true. Most planters were very mobile. They moved from one piece of land to another. They were land speculators. And most of the wealth that they had was not in the form of land. It was in the form of slaves, right? So planters, especially cotton planters, moved very frequently and quickly, taking their slaves with them speculating in land and producing cash crops as they as they went. So the prospect of uh, closing off slavery in the Western territories was economically a problem for slaveholders. In addition, it was a question of principle. Okay, um, let me see if I have I have my quotations. Okay, so it was a question of principle. And uh, a, a judge in Mississippi who was commenting on the Republican Party and the rise of this, this anti-slavery party said, quote, the first act of the black Republican Party will be to exclude slavery from all the territories, from the District of Columbia, the arsenals and the forts, by the action of the general government. That would be a recognition that slavery is a sin and confine the institution to its present limits. The moment that slavery is pronounced a moral evil, a sin, by the general government, that moment the safety of the rights of the South will be entirely gone. So what this judge is spelling out is that it was unthinkable for Southerners to allow slavery to be prohibited in the Western territories, because to allow that would be to acknowledge there was something wrong with slavery. And by this time, so much of Southern society and the Southern economy was rooted in slavery that that was uh, simply uh, out of the question. And that's why this conflict, this sectional conflict, kept uh, escalating. Okay. And by the uh, late 1850s, when, when the sectional conflict has really escalated, uh, the, you know, Congress is at an impasse, uh, the Republican Party is, is threatening to to win possibly congressional majorities or the White House, uh, the uh, positive good argument really has to be marshaled very aggressively on the Southern side. And you see this great plethora of sermons and pamphlets being published in the late 1850s, putting forward the view that slavery is good and that it is divinely sanctioned. Uh, for example, in Richmond, uh, uh, a, a a pamphlet published in Richmond in the 1850s said, uh, the most blessed and beautiful form of social government known, the only one that solves the problem, how rich and poor may dwell together, is slavery, a beneficent patriarchate. Okay, so this is, this is how it's becoming more and more common, especially among the literate classes of the South, to speak in these absolute terms that slavery is the not only acceptable, but is an ideal form of social relations. Uh, another published a, a scriptural vindication of slavery, published in Macon, Georgia, said, Both Christianity and slavery are from heaven. Both are blessings to humanity. Both are to be perpetuated to the end of time. Okay, so a specific rejection of that older idea from the 1700s that slavery should be temporary and eventually be phased out. Okay. And at the same time that this pro-slavery philosophy was being uh, promulgated and promoted in the South, there was a concurrent silencing of opposition. Right? So there had always been Southerners who, who criticized slavery in various ways, who believed that it should be phased out or, or, or who were actually abolitionist. But more and more, those people were silenced uh, by mob actions, right? Uh, paramilitary attacks, uh, attacks on printing presses, and by gag laws, 
right? So it became illegal to print or circulate anti-slavery documents in the South. And you might say, well, hold on a second, that's against the First Amendment. Well, uh, at this time, the Supreme Court held that the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government, right? It only says Congress can't abridge freedom of speech. It doesn't say states can't do it, right? So the common understanding was that states can do whatever they want within their borders. So there were these gag laws preventing people from speaking or writing against slavery that were instituted more and more in the 1820s, 30s, 40s. And uh, important abolitionists like the Grim K sisters from South Carolina, James G. Burney from Kentucky, uh, were basically chased out. Uh, you know, they were sort of ostracized, intimidated, threatened, silenced, and moved north. Okay, so just a, another uh, sort of brief rundown, a recap of this conflict over the question of slavery in the Western territories. Okay, this came up with Missouri, as I said, in 1820. It comes up again in, in the 1830s with Texas, right? Texas... Uh, declared its independence from Mexico, right? So, so American settlers, illegal immigrants in Texas, uh, declared independence, created the Texas Republic, an independent sovereign state, and Texas then sought to join the United States as a state. Uh, but northern congressmen and senators rejected this idea. They did not want to see another slave state which would supply more uh, pro-slavery senators into the Senate. They wanted to prevent the balance from being tipped in favor of slavery. So they uh, reject treaties that seek to uh, admit Texas into the Union. Because these northern senators can block the ratification of the treaty, which takes two-thirds of the Senate, instead Congress simply passes a joint resolution by majority vote through the two houses that annexes Texas. Unconstitutional. Uh, you know, there are sort of, uh, you know, wacky uh, fringe radicals in Texas who say Texas is really an independent country because it was never constitutionally admitted into the Union, and really they have a point. <laughs> it, may, it, may, it may be moot at this point, but technically speaking, that is true. Uh, again, with the Wilmot Proviso in 1846, which concerns uh, New Mexico and Arizona and the, the other, uh, you know, territories that the U.S. wants to take, from Mexico. It comes up again in 1850 when uh, you have, a, you know, with the gold rush, you have a wave of American settlers into California. The population is now big enough. They want to create their own state and be admitted into the Union as a free state, right, without slavery. And this time, Southern senators object and say, we don't want to allow California to become a free state and put two senators into the Senate who will be anti-slavery. So they have to work out a solution and certain, uh, you know, elder statesmen in the Senate are able to work out a complicated compromise where basically California can be admitted into the Union as a free state if the federal government also passes a fugitive slave law, uh, which supersedes all the various state laws around the country dealing with what do you do with runaway slaves? You know, are they, are they criminals? Do you imprison them? Are they property? Do you send them back to the master? Do you let them go? Uh, you know, under what conditions? Uh, what do bystanders have to do if they know about a runaway slave? All of those various decisions that different states have made about how to deal with runaway slaves are all uh, superseded by this uh, fugitive slave law, which basically says, uh, you know, they, they must be returned to their masters, and anyone who doesn't help to return a runaway slave is a criminal. Okay, criminalizes bystanders. And the Fugitive Slave Law, you know, this, this really inflames the anti-slavery feelings in the North because, A, it is imposing this pro-slavery uh, position throughout the country. It threatens to, you know, criminalize bystanders who want nothing to do with the matter, and it clearly, uh, it has no respect for states' rights. You know, the, the Fugitive Slave Law runs roughshod over states' rights as they were understood at the time in favor of a single national policy uh, 
that had been demanded by, uh, by, by the southern states. Okay. So right away we should see that this notion that, well, the South favored states' rights doesn't hold up. Okay. Um, the South was perfectly fine with a strong central national government imposing policies throughout the country so long as it protected slavery. Right? The substance of the controversy was slavery. Okay. Still, even with the Fugitive Slave Law, which, you know, uh, created huge opposition and outrage in the North, still the admission of California into the Union meant that uh, the Senate was now tipping towards the anti-slavery side. And this furthered a feeling of paranoia in the South that inevitably, as the country grew and new states were created, Congress was going to become more and more heavily anti-slavery and that if the South remained within the United States, inevitably slavery would be abolished and they were going to lose this foundation of their society and economy. After the Kansas-Nebraska Act in the 1850s, uh, the, the question is thrown up in the air of whether Kansas and Nebraska will, will eventually become free states or slave states, right? And the question of whether those territories become free or slave states could possibly determine the future of slavery throughout the country, right? If those become, say, for example, free states and send four anti-slavery senators into Congress, uh, slavery is probably doomed. So people from all over the country begin flooding into Kansas, right? anti-slavery activists from a lot of them from New England including John Brown among others go to Kansas and try to create a big anti-slavery majority population to ensure that it will become a free state and senator or excuse me southerners especially from Missouri also go over into Kansas and try to create a pro-slavery majority and uh you know, in such a situation, it's only a matter of time until someone walks down the road to the neighboring village and says, hey, you pro-slavery guys, we don't want you here. We're kicking you out. Stay out of Kansas. Or, or vice versa. And uh, fighting breaks out in Kansas in beginning in 1858. So there's internecine warfare going on in which John Brown himself is involved in Kansas. And this is very important, too. Because once again, uh, the, the question that people were fighting over in Kansas was slavery. Will this, be a, will this territory become a slave state or a free state? It was in no way a question of states' rights. Kansas wasn't a state. <laughs> they weren't in a state. It wasn't a state yet. So there were no states' rights to speak of. It was uh, the, the fighting began over slavery. Okay. So... Uh, once again, when the Republican Party starts to gain a number of seats uh, in Congress and seems as if it might even be uh, within, uh, within reach of the White House in the late 1850s, uh, a sort of panic breaks out among the literate uh, upper classes in the South. Uh, and one uh, minister in South Carolina said uh, every Negro in South Carolina and every other Southern state will be his own master. Nay, more than that will be the equal of every one of you. If you are tame enough to submit, abolition preachers will be at hand to consummate the marriage of your daughters to black husbands. So this is, this is the sort of thinking that was coming very frequently from the pulpits and the presses in the South, that uh, the, the northern section of the country is conspiring against southern civilization. They want to end slavery. And along with that, they want to create equality of blacks and whites, which ultimately means intermarriage. Right? Intermarriage and miscegenation was sort of the ultimate uh, boogeyman that they, that they pointed to. And, you know, it's hard to say to what degree they were totally sincere in this, whether they, that really was their root fear, or if that was kind of what they thought of as a decent excuse or a decent uh, justification for their defense of slavery. 
Okay. So just a last comment about this question of states' rights. Um, you know, there, people often get into these kind of uh, back and forth arguments about was the, sla was the Civil War about slavery or about states' rights? Well, you know, properly speaking, it was both. Uh, you, you know, you can say it was about states' rights, but you then have to ask, states' rights to do what? You know, w substantively, what was the controversy? And the particular right that was at stake in this controversy leading up to, to the war was the right to own slavery, own slaves, and to protect the institution of slavery. That was the actual question. So it's sort of like if you find someone, you know, if someone, say, pushes their spouse out a window and then they go to prison and you ask them, why are you in prison? Is it for pushing your wife or husband out a window or is it for manslaughter? They would properly have to say, well, it's both. You know, the, the specific action that I did was pushing my spouse out a window and the law, the legal doctrine that that fell under, according to the legal system, was manslaughter, right? Well, likewise with this question of the Civil War. You know, the controversy was over slavery, and states' rights was the legal doctrine that Southern people asserted to protect uh, that specific right, you know, that specific practice, that peculiar institution, as, as they called it, okay? Now... That's not surprising when you consider that this doctrine of states' rights was commonly brought up all over all parts of the country through that entire era from the Revolution up to, uh, up to the Civil War. Uh, many northern states asserted their states' rights. You know, Rhode Island refused to ratify the Constitution, partly on the basis of states' rights. Uh, Federalists, during the War of 1812, Federalists in New England actually uh, threatened to secede because they believed it was their right not to participate in the War of 1812. Uh, so their, this idea of states' rights and even the idea of secession was asserted by various different parties all over the country. It just happens that the controversy over slavery is the one that escalated to such an intense level that it eventually led to secession. Okay. You'll sometimes also hear the notion asserted by people on, you know, in all parts of the political spectrum, the, the, the myth that slavery was going away anyway. It was not necessary for the Civil War to be fought because slavery was going to go away anyway. Well, whether or not the war was necessary is a philosophical question that people can freely disagree on. You know, what is a just war? You know, when is it right or necessary to go to war. But it is absolutely inaccurate to say that slavery was going away. Slavery was growing. It was spreading rapidly into the Western territories. The number of slaves was increasing. By, uh, by 1860, there were almost 4 million slaves in the United States. So again, it more than doubles in that uh, generation from between 1820 and 1860. It again more than doubles. So the number of slaves is multiplying. It's spreading into new areas where it had not been seen before. And the southern uh, upper class was very wealthy and very powerful and had a great, you know, inordinate degree of political power in the country. And many southerners uh, proposed and pursued schemes of extending American sovereignty southward into Latin America and the Caribbean and spreading American slavery into these territories as well. Uh, the Pierce administration in the 1850s made preliminary moves to try to annex Cuba and enable American planters to move uh, slaves into Cuba. Uh, another southern uh, adventurer, William Walker, invaded Nicaragua in 1856 and 57. He assembled a private army of mainly southern planters and actually in, uh, saw that there was a, an unstable government in Nicaragua, invaded, and started trying to move uh, 
slave plantations into Nicaragua, and eventually he was uh, captured and executed by the neighboring country of Honduras. Uh, but this was just one sort of more extreme example of these increasingly aggressive schemes to create a southern empire. And these schemes would come up again in a different way during the Civil War, during the Confederacy uh, period. And lastly, uh, there, was, there continued to be a very high value on slaves, right? Slaves were very expensive on the market. People threw down enormous amounts of wealth on, uh, on, on buying slaves. And this demonstrates two things, that slavery was highly profitable, that people wanted uh, slave labor because it, it was extremely and increasingly profitable. And secondly, the main form of wealth in the southern section of the country was slaves, right? There was more wealth in the form of slaves than there was in cash or specie or land or anything else, right? So the idea of abolishing slavery didn't just mean they would lose a source of labor. It meant that a huge chunk of the wealth in the United States would vanish when people lost their property rights in slaves, okay? It's the same as if you were to abolish homeowning or abolish owning cars or abolish bank accounts, okay? It was an enormous fund of wealth that was threatening, uh, that, that, that the Northerners were threatening to simply disappear from the economy. Lastly, there is a notion that you might hear sometimes, and it's, it's sort of had some popularity sometimes in academic circles, the idea that, uh, that the Civil War wasn't really about slavery because uh, it was really about a sort of civilizational conflict between industrial society and agrarian society, right? The North was industrial, the South was agrarian, and somehow, by some logic, uh, you know, industrial society has to destroy agrarian society. Uh, this idea was put forward particularly by the historians uh, Charles Beard and Mary Beard in the early 1900s. In, um, uh, I'm not going to remember the title of their big book. <laughs> Sorry, I can't, can't remember it. But it's something like, you know, the, the, the conflict of civilizations. It's something like that. And, um, you know, they use this kind of half-baked Marxism to say, well, you know, the North was in a sort of different stage of civilizational development, and so they had to destroy the agrarian society of the South. I've never seen an explanation of why, you know, industrial society has to destroy agrarian society. What is the mechanism there? And uh, more importantly, Northern industry at this time was, for one thing, it was very dependent on the southern plantation economy. The biggest and fastest growing industry in the north, as in Great Britain, was textiles, right? Cloth. And the raw material that they were getting was cotton grown by slave labor in the south. So northern industry and northern industrialists tended to be very pro-slavery because that was how they were getting all that cheap cotton fiber was from slave labor. And in particular, uh, New York, by 1860, New York was the biggest industrial city. It was a major textile industrial city, and it was the most pro-slavery city in the North, right? It's where the Democratic Party was strongest. It's where there was a lot of pro-slavery sentiment. And during the Civil War, we'll see that uh, the politicians sympathetic to the Confederacy were elected in New York because northern industry, especially in New York, was dependent on southern slave labor. Now, aside from this, uh, it's simply not true that the north was industrial and the south was agrarian. That's just not an accurate description. Uh, the north was still mostly rural and agrarian, right? And we, when we look at places in the north, like, you know, Vermont or Minnesota, that were intensely anti-slavery and pro-union during the war, they, they were also overwhelmingly agrarian right? Okay, farmers in Vermont who joined the Union Army were not doing it because they were industrial workers, you know. And likewise, the South was not entirely agrarian, okay? The South was mostly agricultural, but there was also growing and prosperous industry in the South, particularly in Richmond and New Orleans, which were both significant industrial cities, rapidly growing industrial cities, and there were factories and mills, 
particularly in Richmond, that were run on slave labor. There's no reason you can't have uh, slaves work in a factory. You know, if you've got the guards and the guns and the barracks, then you can you can make slaves work in a factory, and that was done. And uh, there there was no notion that the industrialization that was beginning in the South was somehow inimical to to slavery in in principle. So this idea, you know, that Beard and Beard put forward, I'm sure there are many virtues and many good points in their work, but uh, this idea has not held up. Uh, but it was taken up, especially in the 1920s, by a sort of movement of Southern uh, apologists who wanted to kind of recast the Civil War and say it wasn't really about slavery, it was about something, you know, anything else. <laughs> uh, but that does not hold up to, to scrutiny. Uh, rather, you know, northern industry and southern agriculture were symbiotic and interdependent. Okay. Even, even people that were not in the textile industry in the north were often producing uh, tools, uh, chains, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, materials and implements to supply the massive slave plantation complex in the south. You know, if, if you're in an area of the country where the land is extremely valuable because of cash crops, you're going to devote all the labor and all the land you can to producing those lucrative cash crops and everything else you're going to need to import. And that's largely why, you know, industries in the north and in Britain were making so much money as well was because they were supplying the slave economy in the south. Okay. So having said that, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this the the 1860s and the period of the war itself. So Abraham Lincoln wins election to the presidency in 1860. Lincoln was not exactly an abolitionist. He didn't believe that slavery had to be abolished immediately, but he was a Republican. Uh, so this was the first uh, you know victory in the White House for this new party, and he did believe that slavery had to be contained within the places where it currently existed. It should not be allowed to extend into the Western territories. The election of Lin Lincoln, not his taking office, not his policies, but the election of Lincoln triggers what's called the secession winter, where now uh, the Southern radicals, who were called fire eaters, who had been calling for Southern secession for years, they now get a new sort of vindication and credibility because of the election of Lincoln. And their argument has a new power now, a new weight to it. Their argument that if the South stays in the Union, inevitably there will be an anti-slavery majority and slavery will be abolished. Okay, so various states start to pass sort of preliminary resolutions saying that they are willing to entertain the idea of secession as long as other states join them, right? As long as they're not alone in it. And various states appoint commissioners, sort of like internal uh, diplomats or am ambassadors to go around to other slave states and encourage them to join in a secession movement, okay? And we can see uh, a lot of these commissioners made similar sorts of uh, arguments and they, they often made not only pro-slavery arguments but explicitly uh, racial arguments, arguments for racial superiority. For example, an Alabama commissioner to Kentucky said, we must protect the heaven-ordained superiority of the white over the black race. Right? This is what they believed was under threat. The first state to actually secede was South Carolina in December 1860. So again, this is after Lincoln is elected, but before he's taken office. South Carolina secedes, and they put forward... Uh, a declaration of secession explaining why, you know, kind of mimicking the Declaration of Independence. And South Carolina declares, uh, you know, I'll, I'll read you a few, a few passages here of what South Carolina, what the South Carolina government says as their rationale for why they have to secede. They said the reason was, quote, the action of the non-slaveholding states. Those states have assumed the right of deciding upon the propriety of our domestic institutions and have denied the rights of property established in 15 of the states and recognized by the Constitution. Right, So that right of property is, is the right to slaveholding. Uh, 
They have denounced as sinful the institution of slavery. They have permitted an open establishment among them of societies, that's, this means abolitionists, whose avowed object is to disturb the peace and alloy the property of the citizens of other states. They have encouraged and assisted thousands of our slaves to leave their homes, and those who remain have been incited by emissaries, books, and pictures to servile insurrection. For 25 years, this agitation has been steadily increasing until it has now secured to its aid the power of the common government, right, which is marked by the election of Lincoln. A geographical line has been drawn across the Union, and all the states north of that line have united in the election of a man to the high office of president whose opinions and purposes are hostile to slavery. He is to be entrusted with the administration of the common government because he has declared that that government cannot endure permanently half-slave, half-free, and that the public mind must rest in the belief that slavery is in the course of ultimate extinction. So again, we see this very clear pattern of explicitly disavowing the old idea that slavery should eventually uh, die out. The next after South Carolina was Mississippi, and Mississippi declared, quote, our position is thoroughly identified with the institution of slavery, the greatest material interest in the world. Its labor supplies the product which constitutes by far the largest and most important portions of commerce of the earth. These products are peculiar to the climate verging on the tropical regions, and by an imperious law of nature, none but the black race can bear exposure to the tropical sun. Okay, this is, this is significant too, because this is one of the points where we see elements of the new pseudoscientific racism that was becoming common in the mid-1800s, right? So Britain had abolished slavery, but Britain was also a rising imperial power. And British and other European scientists were beginning to put forward these sort of half-baked pseudoscientific arguments that there's a hierarchy of races that are somehow, you know, these differences are written into races, and each race has some kind of natural role or station, right? None of this, of course, holds up to biological examination. But here you see this argument that was common in Mississippi that uh, blacks are the, uh, for a bio biological reasons, only blacks can work in the hot sun. So they should be, you know, they should be slave laborers. You know, the, the logic doesn't quite add up, but that was, that was the, the, the line of thinking. A few other states also put forward explanations of their declarations of secession. Not all of them did, but a few did, and another one is Texas. So Texas declared, Quote, in all the non-slaveholding states, the people have formed themselves into a great sectional party, now strong enough in numbers to control the affairs of each of those states, based upon an unnatural feeling of hostility to these southern states and their beneficent and patriarchal system of African slavery, proclaiming the debasing doctrine of equality of all men, irrespective of race or color, a doctrine at war with nature, in opposition to the experience of mankind, and in violation of the plainest revelations of divine law. Okay, so you see here a mashup of all, all these different arguments, sort of scientific, social, and religious. They demand the abolition of Negro slavery throughout the Confederacy, the recognition of political equality between the white and Negro races, and avow their determination to press on their crusade against us so long as a Negro slave remains in these states. We hold as undeniable truths that the governments of the various states and of the Confederacy itself were established exclusively by the white race for themselves and their posterity, that the African race had no agency in their establishment, that they were rightfully held and regarded as an inferior and dependent race, and in that condition only could their existence in this country be rendered beneficial or tolerable. Okay, so for one thing, it's, it's not... Uh, accurate that Africans played no part in the creation of the United States, as this, you know, Texas Declaration is alleging. That, that is historically inaccurate. Now, beyond that, notice that they are, uh, they're creating a sort of complete uh, tapestry of arguments, which includes both the, the propriety of slavery and the, in, the, inherent inferiority 
of the African race and the opposition to race mixing or equality of the races, right? So, so this sort of more complete philosophy of, of white supremacy is now you know, being put forward in these declarations to justify slavery itself and secession. Okay. And this is important for, for later when we, when we talk about what the legacy of the Confederacy has been taken to mean, what it takes to represent. It's not just slavery. Okay. It's, this, it's this more complete, encompassing racial philosophy. Okay. After these uh, various states, including South Carolina, Mississippi, Alabama, had seceded, they then begin to, you know, ally together and prepare to form a confederacy, right? And this confederacy is formally founded and a constitution is adopted in Montgomery, Alabama in March 1861. And naturally, someone should make a big grand address uh, for this occasion of the creation of the confederacy. The president was Jefferson Davis, but, you know, Jefferson Davis was not a great orator. You know, he was not um, really up for the occasion. You know, <laughs> there's sort of no, no one really admires Jefferson Davis. There was really not much of anything good to be said there. Uh, so rather, the task fell to the vice president, Stevens, Alexander Stevens, who was a congressman from Georgia. He had been a Whig early in his career, then became a Democrat, and he was elected vice president. And so he gave uh, this sort of founding speech about what the Confederacy was and what it was all about. And it's been called the Cornerstone Speech. And in this speech, uh, Alexander Stevens says, uh, he, he lists various improvements that the Confederate Constitution had made. Uh, there would be no tariff. Uh, there would, uh, presidents would be limited to only one term. Uh, and and he you know he praises all of these sort of improvements that he sees in the in the new constitution, but finally he says uh, you know most importantly, he says quote the new constitution has put at rest forever all the agitating questions relating to our peculiar institution, African slavery. This was the immediate cause of the late rupture and present revolution, right? So the the issue that's that created this rupture or at least the issue that most immediately created the rupture between North and South was slavery, in his, in his view. He also goes back and he, he reflects on Jefferson, and he, he considers how Jefferson argued that all men are created equal and acknowledged that slavery was morally wrong. And Stevens says, quote, Our new government is founded upon exactly the opposite idea, its foundations are laid, its cornerstone rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery, subordination to the superior race, is his natural and normal condition. This, our new government, is the first in the history of the world based upon this great physical, philosophical, and moral truth. This truth has been slow in the process of its development, so he's acknowledging that this is a comparatively new idea. It has been slow in the process of its development, like all other truths in the various departments of science. It has been so even amongst us. Many who hear me perhaps can recollect that this truth was not generally admitted, even within their day. The errors of the past generation still clung to many as late as 20 years ago. Those at the North, who still cling to these errors, with a zeal above knowledge, we justly denominate fanatics. So, so Stevens, on the one hand, he's saying the, the, found, the ideological foundation stone of the Confederacy is not just slavery, but racial subordination of white over Negro. And he is openly admitting this is a new idea. Even within our own memory, we can remember when this was not generally admitted to be true. But it is now. Right? So the Confederacy was quite revolutionary in this sense. And he's saying this is the first time a state has been founded on this idea of racial hierarchy. That is Stevens's view. Now, uh, I'll, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll step out for a moment now and say this, by all evidence, was uh, 
was understood basically universally in 1860 to be, or 18, 1861, to be the reason why the Confederacy was created and to be the reason why the North and the South were going to war, were in the process of going to war. Slavery and racial hierarchy. Okay. Later, in later decades, people have tried to revise this in various ways and sort of, you know, argue uh, that it was something else or that that was, you know, it wasn't what it seemed. Uh, but people who fought in the war seem to have agreed it was about slavery. And there's this interesting uh, example of a colonel from Virginia named John Mosby, who, you know, had served in the war. And many years later in 1894, when people are starting to put forward alternative ideas or arguments about what were the real causes of the war, uh, John Mosby said in a letter to his friend, quote, I have always understood that we went to war on account of the thing we quarreled with the North about. I've never heard of any other cause than slavery. Okay. That is out of the mouth of a Confederate officer. We, when we were in the war, we knew it was about slavery. That's always what we've understood. It's only decades later that certain people try to change that, uh, that fact. Now, some people are, you know, over the years have, have, have rejected this, this basic reality about what the Confederacy uh, was founded in order to do and what its central ideas were. Uh, partly because this seems to say, it seems to cast the Southerners as entirely bad guys and the Northerners as entirely good guys, right? And it's very easy now that we generally accept that slavery is wrong. It can be very easy to say, oh, well, since, you know, we're Northerners, we clearly were all the good guys. We were all anti-slavery and the Southerners were bad guys. They were pro-slavery. And it's not that simple. Uh, the Northern side was very complicated and, uh, not everyone in, in the governing political or leadership class of the North was anti-slavery, much less were they abolitionist. Only a minority, only a radical minority were abolitionist, meaning they called for immediate total emancipation. Uh, rather, the, there was a great groundswell of support for the war effort in the North following the firing on Fort Sumter. So, right, so that was the first point where the Confederacy demanded that Union troops leave Fort Sumter in South Carolina. And when they refused, they began to attack the fort. There was a groundswell of enthusiasm in the North for fighting back against the Confederates and against the secession movement. Not necessarily because they were all anti-slavery, but rather because they they believed in the Union. They believed it was their duty to protect and preserve the Union. They saw the Union as a crucial legacy of the Revolution. And they didn't want to be the generation that had lost this Union that had been created by the Founding Fathers, by these guys like Washington and Jefferson and Adams, right? Uh, Lincoln basically fell into this camp. So Lincoln was anti-slavery. But he believed it was firstly his duty as president to preserve the Union. He believed that that was his first responsibility over and above any questions about slavery. And that's why, you know, he's often quoted saying, if I could save the Union without freeing a single slave, I would do it, right? Which he did say. Uh, that doesn't mean, that shouldn't be distorted to mean that Lincoln didn't care about slavery or he didn't see it as his goal to end slavery, but rather he believed it was more important for him and it was his fundamental duty to preserve the Union, okay? And this was a very common view in the North. There were people who had all sorts of different views about slavery, but who still came down on the side of the Union. Why did they care so much about the Union? Well, it was this, uh, it was this inheritance from the revolutionary generation, so that was important. And also, in addition to that, uh, democracies and republics were very rare in the world in the 19th century, right? Most European nations were monarchies. You had, you know, Victoria in Britain. You had the Second Empire in France. You had the, the Tsars in Russia. Uh, you know, republics were very rare. And the United States was a sort of very rare example of a democratic experiment. And the common thinking, especially in Europe and in much of the rest of the world, was that democratic experiments like America were bound to fail 
that participatory government republics could never last. And so America was inevitably going to fall apart into, you know, internecine war or fragment or, you know, just be overthrown by a, an emperor. And Lincoln saw it as his duty to keep the American experiment together, to, to prevent the breakup of the Union, which would then vindicate all of those, you know, snooty Europeans who felt that the American experiment had to fail. So, so this was part of why there was such a passion on the part of Lincoln and many others in the North to preserve the Union, because it was a way of defending the notion that they as ordinary citizens were able to govern themselves and that a republic could work and could last. Okay. However, as time goes on through the war, this point of view shifts uh, and the, the primary goal of the war increasingly becomes to end slavery, right? And Lincoln is typical of this shift in thinking that happens over the course of 1862, 63, 64, where more and more, uh, Northerners accept that the fundamental root cause of the war was slavery and that slavery was in a sense kind of the original sin that had cursed the country and had to be uh, cut out. So you have, uh, this is one of the reasons for the Emancipation Proclamation on uh, January 1st, 1863. It's one of the reasons why the Union began enlisting black men as Union soldiers in uniform. Uh, and why the federal government put increase, increasing pressure on slave states within the Union, like Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, to abolish, uh, to abolish slavery within those states so that there would be no slavery in the Union. Because not all slave states uh, seceded. And so one thing to note is that so, some slave states, so-called border states, stayed in the Union. Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, Missouri. Uh, but all the states that joined the Confederacy were all slave states, right? So if, if, if again, if, if the Civil War wasn't about slavery, then why is it that all 11 Confederate states were all slave states? You know, if you ask the, what the people were saying at the time, it's because the purpose of secession was to protect slavery. That was the whole issue. There are, and there are forces on the ground uh, that encourage Lincoln and his sort of ideological compatriots to shift their thinking more and more to opposing slavery. Uh, there were so-called contrabands, thousands and thousands of slaves from all over the South who abandoned, ran away from their owners and masters and joined the Union lines, right? And the Union had to decide, what do we do with these people? What are they? Are they property? Are they criminals? Or are they free people, right? And the Emancipation Proclamation was this, was where Lincoln was basically forced to make a decision on this question and said, look, if a, if a slave gets to Union lines, he or she is a free person. Lincoln met with Frederick Douglass three times in the White House. And the first time, Douglass went to say, I demand that you give equal pay and equal protections to black soldiers. And Lincoln was very resistant, did a typical sort of politician move of, oh, yeah, leave me alone. You know, it's really hard and we have to be gradual and some people aren't going to like that. And... Uh, you know, put him off. The next time, in 1864, Lincoln is getting more and more worried that the Union might lose the war or that he might be voted out of office. And he calls Frederick Douglass to the White House and says, Frederick Douglass, I want you to put together a task force to go down there into the South and get as many slaves off the plantations as you can and make sure they get to freedom. Because when this war ends, we don't know what's going to happen and I want as many people as possible to be freed. So his thinking is changing very quickly, right? And then it's after the end of the war in 1865 that he uh, speaks in favor of the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery. Okay, so that's just a little bit about the Union point of view, right? The Union was not always uh, fighting first and foremost because they were against slavery. It was initially about the Union some people saw it as about slavery, and as time went on, it became more and more broadly accepted that the, the real issue at stake in the war was slavery. Now, as for, uh, as for the Confederate side, if we go back to the, what, what did the Confederacy do and what did it say during the war? Okay, a few, a few questions to address. 
you'll sometimes hear people say that uh, you know, blacks fought for the Confederacy. This is not true. Okay. Never happened. Okay. How do we know? Well, when the war began in 1861, uh, there was, as in the North, there was a wave of volunteers who organized and came forward to fight for the Confederacy. And in some places, especially along the Gulf Coast, uh, South Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, there were significant free populations of free people of color. And uh, some of them were fairly wealthy uh, and had some degree of social status. Some of them were slave holders. And some of these free people of color organized themselves and volunteered to serve in the Confederate forces. And the Confederate generals and Congress said, no, we don't want you. We don't want black men in uniform. And they repeatedly explained over and over again through the whole course of the war, having black men fight as soldiers would go against the entire philosophy that the Confederacy was founded upon, right? So even though some did volunteer, some free people of color did volunteer. The Confederacy said, we don't want you. We only want white soldiers. There were occasionally some instances where some Confederate officers brought their slaves with them, or body servants, as they were called, brought their slaves with them to the war front. Right? So you will occasionally see images of black men in something like a Confederate uniform, because they were slaves who were being forced to go and support the Confederate Army. And we actually know from some writings and interviews with some of these slaves in Virginia, they said they had no interest in the Confederate cause whatsoever. Uh, they wanted to see the Union win. They were only there because they were forced to, to be there. Okay. And the, the, the policy and the law was that no person of color can be a Confederate official or soldier of any sort. Okay. Now, as the war went on, and you get into 1864-65, the Confederacy is starting to become desperate, and you have uh, this idea comes up that maybe they should free, free their slaves and send them to fight. You know, they're running out of men for various reasons. They're running out of soldiers. They're running out of manpower. And there is this population of almost 4 million slaves. So, uh, so the, the question is brought up again and debated intensely in the Confederate Congress in late 1864. And finally, at the beginning of 1865, the Congress basically passes a resolution saying if particular states decide they want to, they can enlist black men, right? If they're that desperate, we'll let them do it. It's up to each state. And Virginia actually started proceeding to recruit and enlist black men in Virginia. There were preliminary steps to organize a unit of black fighters in Virginia. But before anything, before they were ever actually assembled or armed or anything like that, uh, Lee surrendered at Appomattox and the war was over. Okay, so this uh, Virginia unit never happened. Okay. Now, often also the question will arise, uh, why did, if, if the war was about slavery, why did so many non-slaveholders support the Confederacy? And why did so many non-slaveholders fight for the Confederacy? Which is a very good question. There are a number of answers to that question. Uh, one, firstly, the most important one to say, first off, is, well, they were forced to. You know, the Confederacy passed a conscription law in the autumn of 1861. This was the first time that any sort of conscription, forced conscription, had been instituted in North America. Uh, you know, they did it before the Union did. Uh, so people were forced to. Uh, if, they, if they didn't, they were criminals. Uh, nonetheless, that being said, there were certainly many non-slaveholders who very willingly and proudly uh, fought for the Confederacy, even though they didn't own slaves. And they tended to say, we can see that many of their letters and journals, and they've been examined and combed through by the historian James McPherson, uh, they tended to say they're fighting to protect property rights, 
right? They believe in the right to property, and that right is under attack by the North. And you can think of it as a sort of analogy. If today the federal government abolished the right to own a home, you know, only a minority of Americans are homeowners, but a lot of people would be very upset, you know, because it would be an intrusion into basic accepted traditional rights. Many people who don't currently own homes aspire to, right? They hope to eventually own a home, they, and they don't want that opportunity to be taken away. So similarly, many non-slaveholders in the South aspire to eventually own a slave. Many of them had family, friends, neighbors who owned slaves, right? Even if they didn't personally, and they didn't like seeing that right being uh, under attack. Also, many of them did it because they felt it was a duty to their state. Maybe they didn't care particularly uh, about slavery per se, but as they saw it, uh, you know, their home state, Tennessee or Georgia, had decided to secede and to be part of this new confederacy, and they were willing to fight for the protection of their state. Right. So that was that was uh, the thinking of, of some people. Now another important factor here that makes this question a lot easier to wrap your head around is that there also was enormous resistance, right? The, the decision to secede and to engage in the war with the North was extremely unpopular among poorer whites, okay? Uh, opposition to secession was successful in some states. It was successful in Missouri and Kentucky, for instance, which stayed in the Union. Uh, in many other states, it had to be sort of dodged and suppressed in various ways. And once the war had begun, there was enormous refusal, enormous desertion, okay? Uh, and a lot of it stemmed from outrage over the so-called 20 Negro Law. So once conscription was enacted in 1861, later that year, the Confederate Congress also passed a law saying, uh, you know, all men must register and be conscripted except if you own 20 or more slaves. Right? And the idea was basically that uh, you um, needed a certain number of men to stay on the home front to control the slave population. If you took every white male out of Confederate society and sent them all to war, you would have immediate slave rebellion. You had to have someone still there monitoring and controlling the slave population. So they passed this 20 Negro law, but this caused enormous outrage among the non-slaveholding, especially poorer non-slaveholding population who said, quote, you know, this is a rich man's war, poor man's fight, right? The rich men have created this war, but they're forcing poorer men to fight it. And there was uh, enormous displeasure, frequent mutiny, very frequent uh, desertion. Uh, by 1864, when the war was going badly for the South, uh, the Confederate government estimated that almost two-thirds of the Confederate troops were missing, you know, were not actually in the field, and most of those were absent without leave, meaning they had deserted and gone home, whether temporarily or permanently. Right? And this was a huge sap on the Confederate forces. There was also mass refusal of, uh, of supplies. So the Confederate forces needed to requisition uh, food and clothes and firewood and so forth from the southern population to keep themselves supplied. And this was a tremendous uphill battle. There was tremendous uh, refusal. And by the end of the war, when Lee surrendered in 1865, uh, the, ironically, the Confederate army had plenty of ammunition, right? Even though we think of, oh, the South was agrarian, right? The industries in Richmond were very supportive of the war effort and were perfectly capable of keeping the Confederate army supplied with ammo. But the Confederate army was running out of food, right? Because, because the small farming and sharecropping population simply wouldn't supply them. It was not... It was, it was a constant struggle. So they were running out of food, okay? Additionally, there were very large swaths of Confederate territory that were actually Unionist, where the, most of the people remained loyal to the Union, and that were 
for all intents and purposes, still part of the Union. Uh, you see this in certain areas of Tennessee, in certain areas of South Louisiana. Uh, you saw, uh, you know, mutiny, refusal uh, to to support the Confederacy, people uh, continuing to fly the American flag. Uh, there are various reasons why, you know, economic and political reasons why these certain regions uh, were unionist. But the biggest, the biggest unionist region was the Appalachians, right? The Appalachian Mountains running right through the middle of the South. Unionism was very strong in uh, western North Carolina, in eastern Tennessee, northeastern Alabama. Why? Because there were very few slaves in Appalachia, right? Slavery was not a large part of the economy or social structure in in the mountains. And so uh, the Appalachian region remained largely uh, unionist, and this is actually the origin of the state of West Virginia. West Virginia started out as simply the western counties of Virginia that didn't support secession. So they actually held a convention in Wheeling and seceded from Virginia. And they then joined the Union as the state of West Virginia, right? So the very existence of the state of West Virginia is a testament to the the division, the regional division in the South over uh, secession. Okay, so the war ends in 1865 with Lee surrendering to to Grant at Appomattox in Virginia, and this is from this point on Reconstruction. Uh, begins right so this period when the south various states in the south were occupied by northern troops were treated temporarily as occupied provinces without the right to to vote in congress okay um reconstruction again is a time of great controversy there are many you know uh, fights over questions of infrastructure, fiscal policy, uh, whether to readmit these southern states and under what terms. Uh, but the big issue that, that people continued to fight over was the role of the freed slaves in society, right? So under Reconstruction, the slaves were, were recognized as citizens. They were able to vote. They were able to hold office. They elected governors and senators. Uh, it was, there was a great sort of flowering of black civic life during Reconstruction. And uh, the radical Republicans who controlled Congress, especially in 1866, 67, 68, in that period, uh, were very insistent that the federal government and federal troops had to protect the blacks from reprisals, from violence by the Ku Klux Klan, and protect their right to vote and, and their rights to citizenship. So this uh, situation where blacks are actually able to, to vote and participate uh, continues through the 1870s and 1880s, but gradually uh, certain white Southerners sort of beat back and suppress black participation in, in politics. So beginning with Mississippi in 1874, Mississippi pursued the so-called Mississippi Plan in 1874, which basically involved organizing paramilitary groups like Red Shirts, the Ku Klux Klan, to, uh, you know, intimidate and attack blacks who tried to vote, okay? And this wave uh, of, of, of sort of pushing blacks out of politics, out of public life, continues through the 1880s. And again, Mississippi leads the way. In 1890, Mississippi adopts a new constitution, and this constitution uses all sorts of legal maneuvers, like literacy tests and poll taxes, grandfather clauses and so forth to cut black to to deny blacks the right to vote right so this mississippi constitution of 1890 has this whole set of weird hurdles preventing people from voting and it effectively stops any blacks from being able to vote it also stops many poor whites from being able to vote okay and this mississippi model beginning in 1890 sort of sets uh, the stage for for the Jim Crow era, the segregated era, in which you have this racially and class stratified society, right, where where blacks have practically no legal or political rights at all, poor whites have very little, and often are prevented from from voting as well, but uh, but the elite is able to stop poor whites and blacks from uniting together into a political movement by 
keeping keeping them racially divided. Okay. And the bans on race mixing and so-called miscegenation, which had been passed in the early 1800s, are generally kept. Right? And and in su in some states those those bans on interracial uh, marriage remain until the 1960s. Okay. So this period in the 1890s is where the the Mississippi model is spreading, right? Segregation, denial of the right to vote, uh, support for terroristic groups like the KKK. The 1890s is when that is becoming increasingly the model across the South. Okay, this is when the wave of Confederate monument building begins. Okay, this is where it first starts to become common to put up statues to people like Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee and Stonewall Jackson. And ironically, we know that Robert E. Lee, for one, was a was against this idea. In his view, he had helped to fight the war. They had lost the war. They had made a negotiated surrender to the Union. The Union uh, had, had negotiated with them for terms of surrender. And subsequently, the Union government had pardoned the Confederate leaders, had pardoned Jefferson Davis, who went back into Congress, pardoned Alexander Stevens, who went back into Congress, pardoned Robert E. Lee, who became a, a president of a liberal arts college. They, they forgave this act of what was technically treason from the viewpoint of federal law. This, you know, it was, it was treason. Uh, they pardoned uh, these Confederate leaders, and Lee felt that it was only right then to, uh, to accept and recognize the authority of the federal government. And in his view, he didn't want any monuments. He didn't want Confederate flags around, he saw that as disloyal and dishonorable to the surrender agreement that they had made. Okay, But it becomes increasingly common in the 1890s and early 1900s, and especially it skyrockets after 1900. Okay, Why in this period, about 1900 to about 1920, roughly, is the heyday when a lot of these monuments go up, when a, the, flat, the Confederate battle flag is put into state flags, and so forth. Why then? Well, it was, it was the inauguration of the Jim Crow and segregation era. It was a symbol of racial hierarchy. It was sending a message about who is in charge in the South and what their philosophy is. And also, after 1900, industry grew, and the United States was, was industrializing very rapidly, and there was a great deal of prosperity and growth after about 1900. And... Consequently, there was an increasing migration of Southern black people and, and also poor white Southerners as well, migrating into the industrial cities, places like Memphis and New Orleans, and then moving, also moving north, Chicago, Washington, Baltimore, New York, right? And there was a campaign, especially in the South, there was, there was a campaign to stop this migration, right? You didn't want to lose your cheap labor force. You didn't want to lose your sharecroppers. So there was a wave of, uh, you know, there were, there were lynchings, there were, you know, nighttime attacks, cross burnings, and so forth to try to stop people from moving. And also in these cities like Chicago and Baltimore, there was frequent violence of people in these neighborhoods trying to stop this wave of poor Southerners coming into their city and competing for jobs and competing for homes and so forth. So uh, so the Confederate monuments were were sort of a statement underscoring this campaign of, of intimidation. Okay, 1915, the, the, the film Birth of a Nation is made, uh, which celebrates and glorifies the Ku Klux Klan in the 1860s uh, following the Civil War. In 1916, the following year, a new KKK is founded. So it had sort of gone into abeyance. It's reorganized, refounded uh, in 1916. And this is especially an intense, a time of intense conflict because World War I has begun, right? So there is now a world war going on in Europe and the United States is growing enormously and prospering tremendously from uh, supplying the combatant powers, the, the, the belligerent states in Europe. So there's this tremendous, uh, you know, growth, burgeoning of industry, and it fuels not only black migration, but also new prosperity 
and opportunities for blacks. So the new KKK is largely organized to try to suppress this and to, to keep uh, the hierarchy in place. 1917 and 18, the United States enters into World War I, and both white and black Americans serve in uniform, right? So now you have a, a large number, thousands of, of blacks, mostly from the South, going and serving the country abroad in combat. They come back at the end of the war, and they now feel that they deserve some respect and some status as veterans. Many of them go to their hometowns and walk around in their Union, uh, you know, their federal uh, military uniforms. Uh, and they, you know, simply break the, the taboos and act like, you know, proud, equal men. Uh, and this triggers in 1919 the so-called Red Summer, when there's a widespread campaign of lynching across the South, particularly targeted at black veterans, right? And, it's, and it is aimed at ensuring that, uh, that you know, blacks don't move up in the social scale because of their military service. Okay. Uh, in 1921, there is a massive uh, attack on the black neighborhood of Tulsa in Oklahoma, and it is destroyed and more than 100 people killed. Uh, so this is, again, you know, the 1921 Tulsa so-called race riots, which really was just a destruction of the black neighborhood, is part of this wave of violence following World War I. Okay. The Robert E. Lee statue in, that was recently taken down in Charlottesville, right, that was the cause of so much controversy and, and uproar in, in Charlottesville, that statue was commissioned in 1917, right, so during World War I, and erected in 1924, right? So it, it, is, it is part of this campaign of intimidation and suppression during and following World War I. Okay, uh, there's also been a lot of talk and reporting about Baltimore taking down its Confederate statues. Okay, when were those put up? They were put up in 1948, okay? Why 1948? it was on the heels of World War II, right? You have the same situation over again. African Americans go and serve abroad in uniform. They come back and they go to the Truman administration, the Truman White House, and say, we expect protection and, and rights. We have served the country abroad. And Truman is sympathetic. One thing Truman does is he integrates the armed forces. Uh, and this, uh, he integrates the armed forces in 1947. He tells the media that he sees this as an initial step towards eventually integrating all of society. And in response, Southern senators break away from the Democratic Party, form the state's rights Democratic Party in opposition to integration. And Baltimore puts up these monuments in that year, in 1948. Uh, you know, and, and furthermore, Baltimore in Maryland was part of the Union. Right? Maryland was a, a border state. It was a slave state, but it remained in the Union. More Marylanders fought for the Union than for the Confederacy. And, uh, and, and Maryland abolished slavery in, in 1864 during, during the war. Uh, so why would you be putting up Confederate monuments in a city that wasn't a Confederate city? Well, it was, again, it was as a political statement. And we have to remember that uh, as we saw when we looked at the Confederate, uh, the Declarations of Secession and the Cornerstone speech, the philosophy that the Confederate leaders put forward was not just pro-slavery, it was pro-racial hierarchy, right? It was white supremacist. And so when you celebrate the Confederacy, even though they lost, even though the Confederacy lost and slavery was abolished, part of what you're doing is you're saying, well, I recognize that the Confederacy lost, I recognize that slavery is over, but I still believe there was something good that the Confederacy stood for. So what is that? What is the remainder? when you subtract out Southern independence and slavery. The remainder is white supremacism, right? So, so that is what these monuments were intended to celebrate and to inculcate, was that aspect of the Confederacy. Okay. So, so that is, is a sort of overview of the history we need to understand in order to see where these symbols came from, right? why they appeared in the particular places and times that they did. And, uh, and 
we need to we need to recognize that that the Confederacy was explicitly created to defend slavery, and that uh, and that honoring and commemorating the Confederacy serves, among other purposes, it might serve. It serves as a way of defending the idea of white supremacy, and and that that is the particular purpose that these particular monuments were created to to reinforce. Okay. Now a lot of people surely are are not going to like this you know some some people just like denial they just like to say well no it wasn't about slavery you know just just this sort of denial and uh, evasion and you know and 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 that's not good because it's it goes against recorded historical facts but in a way we can also see it as a kind of sign of progress that that today people who are attached to the memory or the symbols of the confederacy are ashamed to say that it was about slavery Okay, at the time they were not ashamed. At a time, the people who created the Confederacy were not embarrassed at all. They were completely explicit and straightforward about what they were doing and why. Uh, so you can see that in a way as a kind of uh, sign of, of of progress that views and values uh, have changed. Uh, additionally, many people won't like it because of what I mentioned before that it can sound too simple and pat that the su the southern side in the Civil War was bad and the northern side was good. And, um, you know, I, I, that's a philosophical question. You know, what makes you a good person or a bad person? What makes for a good cause or a bad cause? That's a philosophical question, not a historical, uh, historical question. But there is, um, I think it is valid to, to, to pause and to caution, to exercise caution and say, you know, if the Union, the fact that the Confederacy fought explicitly and expressly to defend slavery doesn't mean that all northerners today should pat themselves on the back or should gloat and assume that therefore they're the good guys and furthermore it doesn't mean that if you oppose confederate symbols in the public square or that you try to take down confederate symbols in the public square that doesn't mean that you should uh you know gloat and and uh, just assume that you are more virtuous or better than than anybody else, uh, and and I will I, I will point out that uh, you know we can condemn the symbols of slavery that are around us today, and that's perfectly fine. But slavery itself has not gone away. Okay, slavery is still widely practiced around the world. There are today more slaves in the world than there have ever been before in history. Uh, and there are estimated to be around 60,000 slaves in the United States today, possibly around 5,000 in Great Britain and around 60,000 in the United States. What are we doing about that? You know, do you see, uh, do you see young people or, or liberal or left-leaning or moderate people in the public square today saying there are still millions of slaves around the world, we do business with countries and with companies that use slave labor, what are we doing about that? Uh, and you know, my my sound the statistics that I get from SoundCloud uh, regarding this podcast indicate that a large portion of the listeners to this podcast listen to this podcast on Apple devices. Now. We know, generally, we know that Apple uses slave labor in China in all but name, okay? Workers in Apple factories in China, and I'm sorry if there are any Apple employees and this is hard to hear, but they use uh, slave labor in all but name. They take away government-issued uh, ID cards so people are not able to quit. They're not able to travel. They put up barbed wire fences around those factories and uh, force people to work to the point often of suicide, okay? If you want to argue that's not slavery, you know, fine. Go talk to a lexicographer. But what I'm trying to say is don't, uh, don't be morally complacent and don't get, uh, don't, don't let your head swell because you believe you have the right opinion about a Robert E. Lee statue, okay? Ask, look at your own life and your own choices in the world today, okay? So thank you so much for listening. Uh, again, these lectures are on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, and YouTube.
Uh, if you can offer any support and make it possible to keep making these lectures, uh, please look at my Patreon page, also under Historian Splaining. I'll have the link as well as the link to uh, Free the Slaves and uh, Anti-Slavery International, Modern Day uh, Anti-Slavery Societies. I'll have those links in the description. And if you have topics or questions you want me to address down the road, please comment on SoundCloud or email me at historiansplaining at gmail.com. Thank you.